This will be our ninth installment in this series on the Lord's Table. As we associate it tonight with the coming of the Lord. Now nearly every aspect of the life of in Christ, newness of life, is addressed at this table. It's actually it's very profound that so much could be associated with a, with an external act. For instance, the holiness holiness is addressed with this by this table. At Corinth, as you know, they had an unholy person in the assembly. And while many people could not receive this, it defiled being at this table. As why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, purge out therefore the old leaven. Let us observe the feast. Not with old leaven. Purge out there, but with the leaven, but with not with the old leaven of malice and wickedness. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. <clears throat> yes, he was saying that this fornicator contaminated the table. This is the feast he is talking about. You know, the first Corinthians dealt quite a bit with the conduct of the Corinthians around the table. Another thing that this table is associated with is, is washing. Why being washed from our sins. The book of Revelation is addressed to John from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that washed us from our sins in his own blood which is That's right. what we remember here. And it has to do with a confident consideration. Some people's considerations are never really confident. They're really marked by assurance, but that, that's what you should target. First Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as you do this, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth that's a declaration. You do show forth the death, the Lord's death, till he come. So that's associated with this table. A, a public confession yeah. Yeah. <laughs> by all of us that we see the value of Christ's death, mm -hmm. why he died. So it's a public, by, by an act, mm -hmm. it's a public declaration. And the fact of communion or fellowship or intimate involvement is at this table. The cup which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ and the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ. See, there's a, it's more than just a, an act we would call it perfunctory. That is, it's just outward is all it is. But I can tell you that I have been in a lot of communion services that were just outward. That's all they were. It almost seemed like they were calculated to be just outward even. But this is a place of actual fellowship with unseen realities. And the subject of worthiness is addressed at this table. Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Hey, the worthiness. Yeah. Now, some people, when they talk about grace, they think that worthiness isn't included. They have a distorted view of worthiness. They shall walk with me in white. The Revelation says, because they are worthy. So worthy. Amen. He has made us worthy Amen. to be partaker of the saints, inheritance of the saints in light. So worthiness is associated with this table. 
It's like this, the closer you are to Christ and the more you're focused on Christ, the more worthy you are. That's, that's how it works. The less of Christ that's in you, the less of Christ you think about, the more unworthy you are. See, this is a new concept in worthiness now. Yeah. One the world doesn't have at all. And the matter of self-examination, that, that enters into this table, which is a integral part of newness of life is self-examination. When you come to this table, let him examine himself. So let him drink, eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And ju judging yourself, like examining yourself and judging yourself is not the same thing. Judging yourself is, follows the examination. <laughs> Just like in a court of law, the judge doesn't pass a sentence till he's examined all the evidence. So at this table, it, He says, if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 31. He's talking about the Lord's table. Some people got sick. Some people died at Corinth. I don't mean to be a morose in this, but I think that's happened in a lot of churches, and they just thought it was some kind of illness or something. You know, just thought some had maybe died prematurely. They but see, we've got this precedent in First Corinthians, the 10th chapter, right. because the people were slipshod and approaching his table. See, God loves the Son. Amen. <laughs> I'll tell you, the Father loves the Son. Amen. And he doesn't like somebody who tampers with his Son yeah. or treats him lightly. So I've pondered it many times. It's the sort of thing you can't really make a final observation, but God will. So that's something associated with this table. And holy recollection, you've got a memory. You have the capacity to remember. When, some, when people lose their minds to what they call Alzheimer's, whatever, they, they lose the capacity to remember. They can't just a little here and there, a little, little sample of a memory, sort of like the edge of a memory. You lose their memory. Here you can sharpen your memory. They've got medication these days They say sharpens your memory. Helps you to remember. I don't believe it, you understand. <laughs> See, these people think the brain and the mind are the same thing, but they're not. Your brain isn't your mind. Never refer to your thinking apparatus as your brain. Because when you die, your brain's there, but your mind's not. You're going to keep your mind, you're going to lose your brain. So the brain isn't where the stuff happens. And all this medicine's for the brain. But this is here now. Oh, no, this is, this is something here. You can sharpen up your recollection. This do in remembrance of me. With the bread, when you take the bread, remembrance of me. When you take the cup, remembrance of me. What does it do? It it gives you a healthy remembrance. Amen. You become robust. You can reach further in your memory and linger longer in your memory and gain profit from it. So that's associated with the table. And consideration of the brethren. That's at this table. Carry for one another. He says, carry for one another. Don't rush off and have a little private Lord's table over here and then someone else do it. Carry for one another. See, so that's addressed at this table. So you see... See how much is connected with this table. This comes under the heading of what I call the versatility of faith. Faith is uh, very versatile. It's very robust and strong, but very quick and nimble and versatile also. This is something that's hard for the flesh. I had to, some people master it. They're very unusual people that are bulky and strong, but nimble and quick. There's a few people that have mastered this, but not very many, but... At this table, you can make your faith becomes robust, can adapt quickly, can jump out of the path of temptation quickly, can enter into a door of opportunity quickly, knows when to pray, knows when to praise, knows when to ask, knows when to work. See, your faith is activated here, very versatile. Versatility of faith. 
Think about this. You remember to the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, that's as far back as you can go. That's right. <laughs> it's a long way back there. About 6,000 years. In a, moment of t in a moment of time, you pass the timeline. Right. Go back, end up in eternity someplace. You, just, you kind of have to stop there, but think how versatile that is. You, there's, there's just a few things about last year that you could remember. Yeah. But think of here, your recollection reaches backward. And it remembers that... Uh, comes into, into the arena of time and it remembers he laid down his life for us. You recall that happened a couple thousand years ago, but it becomes vivid here at this table. I'm showing you the versatility of faith. And it enables you to live unto the Lord while you're in the world, your faith does. In a sense, you're, you can adapt to this world in a holy way by living for God in an environment that doesn't look like it's possible. Hmm? You can live. Faith enables you to do that. Very versatile. Now we're going to see tonight how faith looks forward, way forward to the end of the world, to the end of time, to the time of the resurrection of the dead, time of the day of judgment. And it sees that far every time you're at this table. We're showing forth the death of Christ till he come. Yes, amen. So that's what we're going to uh, expound tonight. <clears throat> it's good to think about the uh, objective of salvation. I go, well, why did God save us? For some people, about the most they can get is because he loved us, and that pretty much is, saturates their understanding of it. Yeah, that's true, but that's, it's, not, it's not enough. You can't be stable just squatting on that. You've got to have some more insight into it. Now, this is important to the development of this subject. Why did he save us? What's the objective of it all? Well, it's stated this way in Ephesians 3, 19 that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> now you're going to be full of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some people in Scripture were filled with envy. Some were filled with hatred. Some were filled with love. See, the, But to be filled with all the fullness of God, that means that however big your vessel is, it's full of what God is. That's a target now of salvation. You've not, you've not got it yet. You've not that yet apprehended that. Uh -huh. We trust you're making progress regularly in it, but mm -hmm. I can safely say no one here is really satisfied with how full they are of God. But that's an objective. And it's to be filled with the knowledge of his will. As Colossians 1.9 says, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That, not, not just to have an academic knowledge of God's will, like I know he wants me to do this, I know he wants me to do that, but you have this knowledge with all wisdom and spiritual understanding, we know how to implement it. You know how to carry it out. Mm -hmm. God's not glorified by ignorant children. Yeah. Right. We see someone who has a child that's deprived of all their mental capacities, our car heart goes out to them, you know. We realize what a handicap this is, see. God has a lot of children that are retarded. Not by creation, they're not. That's not how God made them. Some people, this is just the way they were born, but this isn't the way God's people are born. God, he wants the fullness of God to dwell in you. For you to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so you know how to do his will. Yeah. See, the important thing is to do the will. Not know the will. Do the will. Amen. Jesus said, I'm here now. I do the will of my Father. That sets the tone. That sets the tone now. Yeah. 
For the redeemed, they do the will of God. It's amazing how few people actually think about this. I'm talking here about now the objective of salvation. Think of this objective. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. <laughs> well, if you had it now, like, what would you do with it? Some people would grow tomatoes or something. That'd be the... <laughs> If they, I got a big field to grow strawberries, they couldn't, they, they wouldn't know what to do with it if they had it. Inherit the earth? That's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. So you, you need to learn how to be faithful over more and more and more and more. Yield bumper crops to the Lord and handle it well and get a bigger crop and handle it well. See, that's because you're going to inherit the earth. That is, God's going to turn the earth over to you. <laughs> it's going to be as, as we're the, body, the whole body. You would just have a part of it, technically. But you're going to turn the world over to us. Ooh, what would happen if he did that now, my? Just some parts of the world have been turned over to people, and they botched the whole thing up. I'm showing where this is headed now. What God's doing when he saved us, he's... He's readying us to judge men and judge angels. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. How well do you think you'd be at judging some angels? If Satan's angels stood before you, and what exactly would you have to say? And if the holy angels, like Michael and Gabriel, like what would you, what would your assessment be? Well, it'd be very limited, to say the least, but he's saying you're being targeted to do this. In the end, to actually do this. And you're going to inherit a kingdom that's been prepared for you from the foundations of the world. A kingdom we're talking about. Not a plot of land, not a house, not even a city, or not a state, or not a continent. A kingdom. And here at the kingdom, Jesus said, Matthew 25, 34, prepared for you from the foundations of the world. See, that's where this is going now. That's what, uh, where this is going is God, eventually you're going to be presented to God. <laughs> what a thought. Most of us have never really been presented to anybody who is important in the world. Yeah, amen. Some people have been presented to the president. Most of us have never been presented to like a president of a corporation, let alone the mm -hmm. president of a country. We're going to be presented to God. <laughs> And we're going to be presented faultless before him, before his presence, with joy. That's where this is going now. So some people will have great regrets tonight for the things they've done today. <laughs> but what about standing before God without fault and filled with joy because none can be found. The all-seeing eye examined you and said, I find no fault in him. Amen. Amen. It's going to happen. That's where this is headed. <coughs> or as Philippians 1.10 says, that ye may approve things that are excellent. Some people can tell when something excellent is there, so they, they make a move to take hold of it. Other people... Hear the same thing, they see no excellence in it, so they go to the movies or something. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth here. But this is God's target, so you can approve things that are excellent, so you can, uh, with authority and with personal benefits, say, that's an excellent thing there, and I'm not going to neglect it. I tell you, if you find a gold nugget, you saw it on the ground, you wouldn't pass it by. Yeah. Not unless something's really wrong with you. So it is with us. So with things that are excellent, things come from God. Prove things that are excellent. And that ye may be sincere and without offense. See, God wants this. I mean, how sincere are you? How much of you is involved with life with Christ? Are you like a double-minded person or a single-minded person? 
Do you serve God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength or attempt to do it with a part of it? Sincere and without offense. What a, without offense. You can't live a day without having to admit before God some kind of an offense. Other people might not look at it that way, but you do. You had higher aspirations than that. This is where we're headed, faults without offense. Here's another thing. It's a target where we're going to know him that is true. The Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. We might know him that is true. All right. Like, how acquainted are you with God? I'm not looking for an answer. How acquainted are you with God? How easy is it, is it for you to tell when he's working or to recognize when he's speaking or to detect when he's leading? That's the aim. Jesus is introducing you to God and teaching you about God so you can know him that is true. <clears throat> you can authoritatively speak on the subject of God. Hmm? Because I can tell you about God, what he likes, what he doesn't, what he loves, what he doesn't, what he's doing, what he's not doing. Been revealed. See, these things have been revealed to us. And it's to be, I'm saying here, what's involved in being saved, what, what this is headed for. That we might be found in him. Not having a righteousness of our own, but the righteousness which is from God by faith. Philippians 3 9. That's it. That's what this has. So when Jesus comes again, mm -hmm. he's not going to be ashamed of us. Amen. Because here in this world, we weren't ashamed of him. Mm -hmm. And here's another objective to receive praise from God. <laughs> Some people do anything to have praise from men, they do anything. Make any kind of compromise just to have men praise them. But God's working out a plan here where in the end, every man, the man being a faithful steward, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, shall have praise from God. That's where this is headed. And there's one other brief summation. is that we might ever be with the Lord. Forever with the Lord. Jesus prayed for this in Gethsemane, that they might be with me where I am. Mm -hmm. He told his disciples, I, I will come again and take you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be. Mm -hmm. Also, in Thessalonians, he said, when he comes again, we'll be caught up to ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever. Mm -hmm. All right, now those are the things that are. Now, when are these things going to happen? that I just listed. When are they going to be fulfilled? It is when Jesus comes. Amen. That's when all these things are going to be fulfilled, brethren. Uh -huh. They're just in a process of development now, but they're going to be fulfilled when he comes. Yeah. We sit at this table. Mm -hmm. We show forth the Lord's death till he come. Amen. When the target that God has set for us is going to be fulfilled. Right. I, want to, I want to prove that from Scripture. That's the time when all these objectives are going to be realized. Take the resurrection of the dead as an example. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, as, as an Adam all die. I said, as an Adam all die. Right. Even so shall all be, in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his, in his own order Christ the first fruits, mm -hmm. and afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Amen. At his coming. Till he come. See, we're thinking about the resurrection of the dead at this table here, because that's one of the things we be found in him. That's at the resurrection, see. How about the presentation of the saints to God? We say that's one of the objectives. Present us to God. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says, What is our hope <clears throat> or joy or crown of rejoicing? 
are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. There it is again. At his coming. Some people, some professed leaders, their crown of rejoicing is that the whole congregation goes out and rakes everybody's yard. Oh, yeah. They, oh, I'm telling you the truth, brother. And this is really, this really, now you're doing, this is what it's all about, they'll say. Well, I contradict them. This isn't what it's all about. You may be in a place where there aren't any yards to rake, like in the middle of a desert. What are you going to do then? My joy and crown, what I'm really rejoicing is, is in your presentation to God. Amen. How about this? 1 John 2.28. Now, I'm showing that the objectives that are listed are all going to be realized when Jesus comes. So that's, the, that's why he says, till he comes. Now, little children... Abide in him that when he shall when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Mm -hmm. See? There's some legitimate preachers and teachers that when Jesus comes are going to be ashamed of their converts. Right. Whew. Sorry about that, Lord. Sorry how that one turned out. Paul's not going to be like be proud of Hymenius and Philetus or Alexander. <laughs> He's not going to be proud of them. Peter isn't going to say, don't forget Ananias. He's one of my disciples. See? You're not going to read that. That's going to be the case. It's when Jesus comes, that's when the presentation is going to be made and there will be confidence and assurance. Jesus will say, behold, I and the children whom thou hast given me. Yeah, all the under shepherds will say, Behold, here am I, and all the sheep you gave me. Yeah, right. huh? Down to a collective family. But here am I, those you gave me. It's going to happen at the Lord's coming. Yeah. Now, faith is going to be found at the time of Christ's coming. Faith is going to be found out as being really legitimate. This is found in 1 Peter 1, 7. I believe the outline there is a 17. It's verse 7. Mm -hmm. That the trial of your faith, mm -hmm. being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, might be found to the praise and glory and honor mm -hmm. at the appearing. Amen. I see, at the appearing of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, I've shown that this... What, salvation is targeting yeah. now we're developing that it's going to be fulfilled mm -hmm. when Jesus comes that's right. so that's why we do this till he comes right. we're not like we're not like in a holding pattern we're in an advancing pattern Amen. Amen. Jesus is going to come to us till he does we're making an advancement right. to him and pretty soon we're going to we're going to meet And the judgment of the living and the dead. See, that's going to happen when Jesus comes. It's 2 Timothy 4 1. 2 Timothy 4 1. I charge thee before God, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing. See, that's when it's going to happen. How about this reward for serving the Lord? Paul called it praise from God. When's that going to happen? Well, you have it here in 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Then shall every man have praise from God. Here's another about the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give unto me, not unto me only, but unto all those also that love his appearing. Amen. <laughs> How can you keep his appearing like in ready recollection? It can sometimes get away from you, the fact that he is coming to get. That's what this table is, a, right. is a stimulus. It's like a, 
like a kickstart. It's like a priming of the pump. Right. So for those who say, well, I, we don't want it to become too common, so we just do this, you know, once a month or once every three months or four months or once a year. The people like that shouldn't say anything because it divulges how utterly stupid they are. You cannot get ready for Christ's appearing without some kind of recollection or stimulus. Mm -hmm. And this table is a strong stimulus because there's nothing about this table that's about you. Yeah. Uh -huh. This table is exclusively devoted to a recollection of Christ. Mm -hmm. This is not where you remember your sins. Uh -huh. It's not where you remember your good deeds. It's not where you remember your friends or your loved ones. That's, this is where you remember Christ. And by that very token, this moves you toward yes. his coming. <clears throat> and when is it that we will be found blameless? Remember, one of the aims is to present us faultless before the Lord. <clears throat> First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.8, Who shall confirm you to the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the world says every dog has his day. Your time will come. Well, Christ's time is coming. That's right. He's going to have his day when nothing else is going to count but him. The only thing that will last is what's connected with him. <clears throat> the only people that will be advantaged are people that live for him. Everybody who's disconnected from him, everybody who didn't live for him, they're going to be eliminated. Amen. Yeah. That's at Christ's coming. When he comes. So that's when, that's when you'll be presented faultless. That's right. Don't be bragging about the fact that you're faultless now. Even though your sins are forgiven. When you're faultless there. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be because you're forgiven. Mm -hmm. You've got to really see this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be because you've been made faultless. Mm -hmm. You've been made pure. You're going to be a new, you're a new creation. You're not going to say these will walk of me in white because they were sinners. That's not going to be the perspective of glory. Yeah. Technically, I suppose we'll know it, although I'm not quite sure about that. Mm -hmm. But technically, I we will know that we past we came from. But see, our focus is going to be on the one who brought us there. Yeah, it starts here at this table. This is where we're going to be changed. I like the way it says it here. It doesn't say our bodies are going to be changed, although that technically is what it is. But it says we will be changed. Yeah. Our conversation is heaven from whence we look for the Lord Jesus, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. But we are the ones that are not going to be ashamed before our body, see, the change will be complete, in other words. We've, yeah. we've started the change in salvation, that we've started the change. It's not yet completed. That's right. When is it going to be completed? At Christ's coming. Mm -hmm. Until then, you're saddled with something you'd rather not be have to contend with. Then's when we'll appear with him in glory. Jesus said, remember, that in his prayer, that they might be with me where I am. He told his disciples, I'll come again to where I am, there you may be also. Well, when, when is that going to happen? Here it is, Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. See, that's when that's going to happen. You want to be unblameable. Mm -hmm. That's how it's going to present us, without blame. Yeah. Or spot or wrinkle or any such thing. When's that going to happen? Mm -hmm. I understand there's a sense in which it's, it's going on now, but it's, it's not what it's really intended to be. God doesn't intend for faultlessness to take place while you're in the body. You're going to have to deal with infirmity. Yeah. Not there. Not there. Here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. To the end that he may establish your hearts 
unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's, that's when it's going to count. You can go to bed tonight morally perfect. Mm -hmm. You just confess your sins, right. cleanses you, and you're, like at this point, you're morally perfect. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow you're going to have to go... <laughs> Got to go through the same thing again, but you'll never go through it again Amen. when Jesus comes. Amen. Amen. Without blemish, you'll be presented. We'll be gathered to the Lord at His coming. First Thessalonians four sixteen and seventeen. And one other thing. We've received a lot of grace already, no question about it. But you haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. Peter said this in 1 Peter 1.13, Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end. Amen. What do you mean the end? To the point where all this, the reason why God's done all this is mm -hmm. going to be fulfilled. To the end. For the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's when you get the whole package. Amen. So now I ask you, does it make good sense that when we remember him, we show the Lord's death till he come? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's when everything that was accomplished by Christ's death will be brought to its intended mm -hmm. culmination. The coming of the Lord directly relates to the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the next stage. There are three phases of Christ. There are three appearances of Christ that are delineated in Scripture. They are found in Hebrews 9, 24, 26, and 28. It says, He now appears in the presence of God for us. Once in the end of the world, He appeared to make an end of sin and his second appeared then they'll look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation so you see the death of Christ and the coming of Christ are inextricably mm -hmm. linked together so that if you properly remember Christ your mind shoots forward yeah, that's right. to the coming of the Lord the fact that Christ's coming, the fact of Christ's coming makes our remembrance more weighty. Yes, that's right. It's like, it's like an anchor. Mm -hmm. It's anchored to it. That it, it testifies that God hasn't forgot the work that started. It may look like a lot needs to be done, but the coming of the Lord is going to confirm that, that what needs to be done will be done. He's going to lead us all the way to glory, brother. He's going to do it. Amen. The coming of the Lord emphasizes that the benefits we realize in Christ's death are only preparatory yeah. at this time. Amen. That's why it's foolish to talk about can a person once saved always be saved or is it true that once you're in Christ you can't be taken out. That's why it's foolish to indulge in such ignorant speculations yeah. because we're not completely saved yet. That's right. Amen. There's a part of us, there's an enemy in the camp. Mm -hmm. Just like there's a fornicator in Corinth, there's an enemy in you. In you. Mm -hmm. it's your, in camp, it is resident in your body, but it's the old nature. God's left it there. He's left, he left it there like he left some Canaanites in Canaan. <laughs> But in the end, for it's all done, Israel is going to get Canaan. Now they're just occupying a part of it. In the end, when Jesus comes, everything God intended by salvation will be brought to a final conclusion. Right. What? It's almost an incomprehensible thought. Mm -hmm. There are people a lot older than me. There's a lot of uncompleted work in me. And the the recollection that it's going to be completed, boy, that, that puts fire in my bones. Amen. And this table mm -hmm. sharpens my remembrance, sir, if I may coin the yeah. term, up as I do this in the 
until or till the Lord comes. Brother Gene has our exhortation.